Um, uh, Gabriel was talking about Hello, can you hear me? Does it work? Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. So, I mean, uh, thank you for the introduction, Johannes, and thank you for inviting me here uh, to this wonderful uh, conference here in Pittsburgh. And yes, so as Johannes already said, um, I'm now working in Amsterdam, and we are interested in bringing Sledgehammer to Lean. So essentially, develop something similar to Sledgehammer in Lean. So, like, I mean, when people hear the word Sledgehammer, they always like get the feeling that this is the magic button that if you just press it, it will prove all your theorems. I mean, that, and like, it, it succeeds in a to a certain degree, very well at that goal. I mean, it can prove small things. I mean, you can use it to figure out what lemmas there are in a library if you like are new to something and want to know how is this called. I mean, is this some combination of lemmas that you already know? Then you can set up a lemma and call a sledgehammer on it, and you get some result. You get a proof, and it will tell you, oh, I used these and these lemmas. So it, you get some information, even if it doesn't solve all your problems. And you can also use it to like uh, make some quick progress on uh, theories. Like if you just need a proof and you don't care how it looks, you just call it sledgehammer. And in many cases, this improves your productivity. So it, sledgehammer is quite popular, and I mean various uh, adaptations of the sledgehammer like approach have also been used in other systems. So there is like holy hammer for hall and uh, cock hammer for cock. Uh, just some recent examples. So I, I think, so far I haven't even told you what Sledgehammer is. So for, I mean, I think that many of you know what Sledgehammer is, but for those of you who don't, so it's an original tool in Isabel Hall, uh, which uh, takes the current goal that you want to prove and uses external theorem provers to prove it automatically. So external theorem provers like Vampire, E, and recently also SMT solvers and other tools. But, uh, but here uh, yeah, man, we are starting and focusing on like first order theorem provers like Vampire and E and so on. Okay, so we want to get this tool into Lean. So how should this look like in Lean? So this is a, an example of something that you can expect such a hammer to prove very that's easily. That's true, or is that just a dream? Um, oh, it, it's true. I mean, hammer will return, will return successfully on this thing. And I mean, like the nice thing about uh, writing automation proof systems is that you do not really need to care about uh, whether your automation is correct, whether there are any bugs in it. As long as it works, I mean, you have a proof. I mean, since the system always checks your proof, you, you can't really do anything wrong. I mean, it can take forever. It can be very fragile, but that's really all the problems you can get. And so if it works, then it works. And yes, in this case, it works. <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, yes, um, yeah, so as you have already said, I just started working in Amsterdam, so like I've been looking into this uh, since November or so, and like the empirical data I'm showing you today is from last week. So this is pretty much uh, like a status report of a very, very work in progress tool. Okay, so um, yes, I'm not really decided yet on any of the syntax or so, but yes. Uh, I mean, ideally in the future, this would be, for example, a whole command where you would in VS code then just uh, press control dot and you could expand it into some other tactic that is faster. Okay. And yes, so really this should be a general purpose. It shouldn't be like same person where you need to annotate things. So like it should just work as good as it can without any major setup. So the way this typically works, I mean, as it works in, in Sledgehammer originally, is so, again, we want to pass the current goal to an external theorem prover. And these theorem provers, they, like, they want a list of axioms, of assumptions of previously proved lemmas, and a goal. So if you pass them the whole lean library or Isabel library, this will be way too large. So first of all, the file will be huge that you pass. And second of all, 
the external field improver just gets worse and worse and worse the more information you pass it. If you give a resolution prover a few thousand theorems, it will typically not do very much unless there's an obvious contradiction in their language, if you have false an assumption. Okay, so like the first thing is we really need to cap this down a bit. So the, so what Isabel does and like all the other hammers is to use some kind of statistical uh, heuristics to find lemmas that look relevant to the current one that are, for example, syntactically similar in the sense that they have the same constants, that they maybe have some similar patterns in the terms. And I mean, I guess you can also expand this to use like more principled machine learning. And I mean, that also there are some papers, uh, I think, from the group in Innsbruck on that. Okay, and then once we have those lemmas, like a finite subset of those lemmas, like something between 10 and 1,000, so just to give you an idea of the order of magnitude, we want to pass them to the external prover. And here comes the next step. We need to encode them in such a way that the external prover understands them. So lean has a very expressive logic. So there is, uh, uh, even on the, like, the foundational side, I mean, there are dependent types, there are uh, lambdas, there are, there's lots of higher order reasoning going on. And also on the higher levels, there are type classes, there are various features in the library that are uh, probably hard to understand for external theorem provers, which work, for example, vampire works in first order logic. And I mean, even like recently, provers like vampire and E, they have been like working on extending the support to more richer logics, like for example, supporting uh, weaker or weaker or less weak versions of higher order logic or induction. But in all of these cases, uh, it's really, there's still a huge gap. I mean, even if, for example, vampire supported full higher order logic, so like simply type higher order logic, it's still a pretty far gap to leave. So that you always need some kind of encoding step from our expressive logic to the logic of the external theorem prover. Okay. And so, okay, now you run your prover, it returns true. The next problem is you need to like take the information that the external prover gave you and turn it into a proven lean, right? Because that's really what you want in the end. And just the information the external prover says yes is not nearly enough. You want the system to actually check what you're producing here. And I think we've heard the sentiment already today that uh, there is no real standard for proofs in SMT, and exactly the same thing also holds true in the first order theorem proofing world. So while there is some syntactic standardization of a proof format, uh, there is no semantic uh, standardization of it, so there is no standardization of what inference rules can be used, or how they should be encoded, or what kind of preprocessing they can do, or what kind of definitions they can introduce. All of that is very much ad hoc. So. Realistically, if you want to prove such uh, first order proofs line by line, you would need to write one parsing module for every version of every prover that you want to support. So people don't do that. They just look at the proof and look at well, what lemmas did the external theorem prover use. So in a sense, we are like cutting down the library in two steps. So in the first step, we're looking for some heuristics. Then we run an external theorem prover to like narrow the selection down even more, because typically you like want less than 10 lemmas to prove your goal and this suffices. <laughs> and then once you, uh, yes? So just like optimize the margin, right? Score and then yes, I mean, it's a similar idea, I guess, yes. So in a sense, the, it, it's an analogon to the unsatisf unsatisfiable cores of setups, because a subset of the input problem that is still unsatisfiable. Yes. And the moment, but we, we, we don't iterate anything here. So we like run the prover once and then we get some lemmas back and that's it. But now this prover is just sim or you have to write your own prover now? Oh, so the one in the last? Uh, so luckily I have already written a first order prover in lean. So uh, for those of you who went here at the lean together last year, so um, I wrote a small uh, kit. I'm talking too much. So I've written a small uh, superposition proof in Lean uh, called Super, and so it's uh, kind of like medicine, Isabel. So, like, it, it, the approach is similar to Isabel. So Isabel runs Metis here to reconstruct the proofs, and here I'm using Super to do this. Okay. 
So, well, let's go through this, uh, so this pipeline step by step. So parameter selection is currently something extremely basic. So it's based pretty much on the approach in Cockhammer. Uh, so what we do is we want to compare the syntactic similarity of the current goal with the lemmas that are already in the environment. And we do this by uh, considering some features of those lemmas. And the features that we consider are two kinds. So on the one hand, there is the names of the constants that occur in the lemma. And on the other hand, the, if, if you have a function application in the lemma, so for example, a plus with a zero on one side, then we, we store the pair plus and zero. So in a sense, the, these two kinds of features here, like the constant names and those edges in the term graph. And we ignore uh, all kinds of uh, logical constants. I mean, as I, I think we've heard it all this week, uh, that the extensor quantifier connects all areas of mathematics. So really, I mean, just because lemma has an extensor quantifier doesn't mean it's close to what we have here. So that's why we ignore it. And the type classes and type class instances are part of a bigger problem, which I'll mention uh, like very soon again. So if something's a group, you'll ignore the fact that... Yes. So mainly, so yes, um, um, I'll come to it in two slides, but just to uh, answer it now. So the reason is that quite often in Lean, we have statements that are proof in an appropriate generality. So you prove something for any group or any monoid or, and then you want to apply it to the integers. So you have a lemma about groups that contains, for example, the type class instance, uh, group to model, and so lots of information about type classes and type class projections. And then you want to apply it to your lemma, which has neither the type class nor the type class projection because it refers to int.tasmal instead of uh, int.group. So like there's really li little similarity there if you compare the type class instances. I've also considered uh, reasoning a bit more principled about type classes, like looking, oh, we have integers here. So we look at lemmas that have like the type classes that uh, in integer has, but that's kind of hard in a like fast way. Because I mean, first I thought I could just look at a like extend graph of the instances in lean, but that's also not enough. Cause uh, first of all, these loop, if you just look at the hat symbol, it's like the easiest approach is just to ignore them and hope for the best. I suppose we're trying to prove say that AB is a B is a Yeah. So which pairs FG are you going to get? Uh, oh, here. So um, there is an. So you have a multiplication and an inverse. Well, has mole dot mole? Is that what you get? Yes, has mole dot mole. Then you get. Uh, wait, is it oh. has inf dot inf? And then you get the pair uh, has mole dot mole has inf dot inf. So this is all the features you would get from that lemma. Yes. Right, and so. We compare, so like for each lemma, we now get a set of these features and we compare those sets of features via uh, this common uh, technique called TFIDF, term frequency, inverse document frequency. So what we do is we take the set of features and this set of features now corresponds to a vector in some finite dimensional vector space. Essentially, you just take the characteristic function of this set, so like zeros and ones, and then you embed it into R to the like number of features you've got. And the important part is that you scale each uh, feature by how rarely it occurs in the environment. So something like has add dot add will occur very often. So you scale it down because, uh, again, heuristically, just because there's an addition of lemma doesn't mean it's useful because lots of stuff contains addition. On the other hand, if you've got something that's very rare, uh, I don't know, like some really particular definition that only occurs once or twice in the library, if it occurs both in a lemma and in a current goal, you probably want to use it. So that's like the heuristic behind it. And then you essentially just compute the cosine of the angle between those vectors and you get a similarity measure. And now you just pick the closest lemma in this uh, sense. So, and yes, the part that is uh, practically important here is doing this in lean is at the moment pretty slow. So I had to do this in C++. I hope it will improve in the near future. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. So there's, 
I mean, we are, might be switching to some other versions of Lean soon. So, I mean, I thought, well, um, discussion. yeah, discussions tomorrow, right? Um, I mean, in, in any case, uh, doing it in Lean is quite prohibitively expensive. So it takes like half a minute, a minute, just to compute all those feature vectors. And uh, and then you don't, I mean, like, right now you already have floats. But if you, if you use Lean 3.4, you don't even have floats. You don't have logarithms. You can approximate it. but yeah. Um. OK, um, yeah. so just to elaborate once again on these typecast issues. So as I said previously, the um, problem is that we quite often want to reason about concrete structures and have lemmas that are proof with an appropriate generality. And this means in Lean that you have typecasts and typecast instance terms. So for example, here, pre-orders and also conversions from pre-orders to the uh, like the operations that occur in the lambda but not in the term and that's so not in the current goal which talks about natural numbers so that's why I'm just ignoring the type class instances and type class instance terms for the moment okay and for example even if we did some magic with type class instances uh, we still would want to make sure that we do not uh, artificially prefer specialized instances. I mean, because useful lemmas might be very general, and you, you don't want to uh, advance, give an advantage to theorems just because they're written for every kind of special structure. I mean, this is a serious thing. Right. Okay, so, so much for the uh, first step. Okay, um, how much have we, have we got? Oh, okay. Yeah, good, good, good. Okay, so now we come to the point where we pass the problem to an uh, external theorem prover. And as I said before, we need to we need to encode the problem into a language that the theorem prover understands. So, for example, for vampire, this is first a logic. And so I've implemented two kinds of translations here. One is based pretty much literally on the approach taken Cockhammer. So this is an applicative translation from Lean to first order logic. So what does an applicative translation mean? It, it means that we have a binary function symbol which encodes application. So like if you know first order logic, it deals with function symbols of fixed arity. And in Lean, we have uh, function symbols that can be applied partially that you can apply to any number of arguments. So what the applicative translation does then is to introduce a binary function symbol and essentially only have current application. Uh, concretely, so we have this binary function symbol for applications to encode the implications of terms in Lean. And then for every lemma, we write down its type. And for that, we have several other predicates. We have a predicate that tells us if a proposition is true. We have a predicate that tells us that a certain term has a certain type. And yes, uh, we have a constant for the universe. So for type u, there's a constant. And importantly, equality is translated as equality. And then we translate uh, the type of a term of a lemma as an appropriate first order expression in these uh, predicate and function symbols. So to give you a concrete example, consider the lemma net dot uh, which says that for every number, for every natural number n, n is less or equal than n plus one. And like if you write this in lean uh, with all uh, implicit arguments shown, it looks like this. So there's a constant, has Lee dot Lee, which is applied to nat, which is then applied to, to nat dot has Lee, which is then applied to n, which is then applied to nat dot suck n. And so if we want to encode this term here, in using this applicative uh, encoding, we write it as this big application here. So as we apply has Lee dot Lee to nat, and then we apply this term to nat dot has Lee, uh, and so on. So this really follows the syntactic structure of the term uh, in the lean type theory. 
And the full translation of the type of lemma is then for all n such that n has the type nat, we, this uh, proposition here is true. And in this manner, you just encode all the lemmas that you have uh, with the translation, and then give it to the external prover, and the external prover will tell you uh, whether this is uh, provable or not. In a certain sense, you can think of this as encoding uh, like typing judgments of the uh, type TV. So we have a typing judgment for something has a type, and something has type prop, uh, and something is, and some prop is inhabited. Because lean is proof irrelevant, we can just ignore the proofs here. And like the terms just uh, correspond to the terms in the type theory. Okay, and this is the like the textual input format uh, used by Vampire and other first order theorem proofs. It's called TPTP. And yes, it, this is the string we pass to the first order theorem prover. I mean, as you can see, this is already like. In lean, we have this a small term. If you write it down, it's n less or equal uh, n dot suck, and that blows up quite a bit uh, when you pass it to the channel theorem prover. Okay, and this is not the only issue with this kind of translation. It not just like really expands the term and makes problems like harder just by making it them larger, but it's also unsound. So, in, and by unsound here, I mean that it does not preserve unprovability. So there are certain lemmas in lean for which is translation, so which are not provable in lean, but for which the translation is provable. And this is, is because of universe issues. Or? Oh, there's two reasons here. So like, uh, like the second reason is the universe issues. So if you remember, we for simplicity, um, <coughs> universes like type u and type u plus one are translated to a single constant. So then we don't need to uh, reason about universe levels. So this is one reason, so you get your Ross paradox due to that. And the, and the other interesting one is that definitional equality and propositional equality are identified in the circuit. The oh, <laughs> unfortunately, they're not the same um, in, in lean. So lean is not an extensional type theory. And there are lemmas in lean that, that look very much true. So maybe I should actually put this on the slide. Um, I think you can read. So, um, lemma is that any two heterogeneously equal functions, uh, and for any other two heterogeneously equal arguments, uh, the application should be heterogeneously equal. So it's right, right, right. Yeah. Oh, bigger, 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 bigger. Okay, good. Yeah. So. It's just boilerplate. So we have like two type families. And then we have. <laughs> so then we have like two functions. And then. So, um, front and X, X prime, not for prime, and so now, now comes the actual theorem. So <laughs> if F is heterogeneously equal to F prime and X is heterogeneously equal to X prime, then F, X, yes, uh, should be heterogeneously equal to F prime, X prime. And this is the theorem that I'm sure uh, that I'm believe as far as I didn't write anything wrong here. That is not provable in lean. Um, so I believe it, it actually fails in the cardinality model of lean. Uh, so it's not even true. Oh, I mean it is true in in, in type theory, right? I mean if you have like two equal functions and two equal arguments. It's true to me, yeah. yeah, but it's not provable in lean. Right. So, so you can't give models of lean. Yes, I mean, that's, I think the cardinality model uh, satisfies the negation of this theorem. Well, that is no mathematics. <laughs> yeah, but the point is, once we have such uh, theorems that cannot be proven in lean, but can be proven by the external theorem prover, reconstruction will always fail. So even 
I mean, so if you prove something, but this might come in handy, but there is actually a valid lean proof, then we might miss the valid lean proof. So, I mean, I don't think that these are really a big issue in practice. And I mean, also that this is also argument, argued in the Cockham paper, but like it, it's always a bit, uh, I'm always a bit uneasy when you have, I mean, it's already a very uh, fragile enterprise as it is. And if you then know, oh, well, I mean, I have a reconstruction procedure and I'm not even sure whether it could work in theory. So it, it just becomes uh, harder to debug this kind of things. Uh, yeah, so, okay. Anyhow, so it is uh, unsound. This was just the point I was trying to make. Okay. So, okay, this is in some sense a bit of an issue because it means that uh, we cannot, the, function that takes proofs from the external theorem proof cannot always translate them back. Like it, it is definitely unable to because of these counter examples. Mm, uh, you mean the one with the universes? Um, yeah, I mean, we, I think we, we heard uh, this yesterday in the deep hole talk, I mean like, that once you find the easy proofs of false, I mean, they might actually pop up. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. So I think that your paradox is actually complicated enough that the theorem proof might not be able to find it unless somebody actually has like a small example formalization of it in lean, which might happen. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't know. So, I mean, I wouldn't be too worried about it again in practice. Okay, and what is like I think a much much more pressing issue uh, with this kind of translation is that it uh, encodes type class instance terms literally. So not just because they are huge typically, but also because now we've got lots of new problems that the external theorem proof needs to solve. So just in order to apply this wonderful lemma here uh, about the reflexivity of the lesser equal relation for pre-orders. So if you want to apply like oh, less or equal is reflexive to natural numbers, you would need to prove that a pre-order dot has LE of something and the type case instance here is equal to nats dot has LE. And you need to prove this quite a lot for various different kinds of type case instances. You actually need to show that all diamonds that can occur there are, are equal. Um, you, which is a certain amount of work that the external theorem proof needs to do, which, I mean, which, like you also see it, like how long these theorem proofs run. Um, with this translation, they run pretty long. I mean, as compared if you do not have these type case instances. Uh, so, I mean, what we, how I do in any case in order to uh, mitigate this is to add uh, extra equations relating to type case instances. So, these are typically not present as lemmas in uh, lean, but we actually synthesize them. So whenever we have like net that has LE and such a term, we try to unify them and give the resulting uh, equation to uh, the external theorem proof. Okay, so we have now this applicative translation introduced in Kalk Hammer, uh, which has like two issues. Let's say it's, it is unsound and it also like type classes are a bit of an issue. So we've also been thinking about um, doing different kinds of translations. So, and the one thing that we've been looking into is to study a translation into simply type tire or logic, which in a sense tackles both of these issues. So what is simply type tire or logic? For those of you who don't know, it's essentially a small extension to first our logic where we have simple types. So types can be Booleans or other base types like natural numbers and function types. There is no dependent functions, uh, no dependent, no pies, anything. It's just uh, simple function types. And then terms are also constructed very easily. Types cannot contain terms. So it's a very stratified hierarchy and terms are just constants, applications, variables, and lambdas. Um, typically you even have the like universal quantification is a constant that maps the predicate to booleans. Especially Yes, so there are also, so it's also a monomorphic simply type tower logic. So there's 
you could also have here variables in the types and then have uh, type, uh, so like type constructors like list uh, separately in the uh, in this in a similar logic here, but I've uh, tried to keep it as simple as possible. But there's really like monomorphic uh, simply type tarot logic. Okay, and now we want to do a translation into this logic in, instead of uh, like the, this applicative translation. And this will have two big advantages. So on the one hand, we're now looking at an abstraction, a sound abstraction of the problem. So we are no longer encoding uh, all universes as the same constant. We're actually trying to be very precise here and translate each universe as a separate constant. And we also uh, <coughs> translate uh, function application to the simple function application. And also in this case, we won't even be able to express equality between types. So this will just not be possible to express in this logic. So and it's an easy way to get rid of the problems. But I mean, this is not just, this is not the only advantage we get here. Uh, it also, uh, where it also attacks the problems with typecast instances on two ways. On one hand, if we consider like, this translation here, the example no longer needs to reason about the equality of typecast instances. It no longer needs to figure out that the less or equal relation obtained from the uh, group typecast instance, uh, from the, um, no, from the, let's say, linear ordered field instance is equal to the, uh, to like the original declared less or equal instance. Because well, before we pass it to the example proof, we can just use lean to make these uh, checks. And this is maybe a bit more uh, work for the future, but once we have a translation that actually goes to a higher logic and not just to some untyped first logic, we now get types. Uh, we now map, for example, the integers to one type in the higher logic. We have natural numbers to type in higher logic. And then we can actually tell the external proofers that these are the natural numbers and these are the integers. And for example, this is the addition on the natural numbers. And with that information, the external prover can do uh, more sophisticated reasoning techniques. So for example, Vampire has some built-in reasoning for real numbers and uh, linear integer arithmetic. And in this way, the external prover can be more clever about what it does. Uh, also, it allows the external prover to synthesize lambdas, which you which which is much harder to do in the application translation. You can't give like uh, K and S and I combinators, uh, but you, the example prover cannot uh, invent lambdas by itself very easily. And if you target higher logic, this uh, theoretically allows a much more sophisticated external theorem purpose. It can also now do uh, some limited form of induction. There's also a bit of a, more of a research project here. Okay, so this is kind of the general idea that we want to do here. And this translation, it works in two phases. First, we abstract the lean terms into simply type tyro logic terms. And here's an example. So if we, for example, have the reflexivity of uh, pre-orders, then we translate it to a higher logic term, which is one universal quantification. So we do not translate this quantification over types and type case instances. First, because we cannot translate quantification over types uh, in higher logic. And we do not want to translate the quantification of type guess instances. We want to handle all the type guess instances on the lean side. And then there is one constant here corresponding to the less or equal relation on this now type alpha with the corresponding instance. And this will be one constant that is passed to the external theorem proof. The external theorem proof will never know that there are type classes here. It will just know that there are natural numbers and integers and we take care of all the type case reasoning. And it's like a fairly straightforward abstraction. Whenever you have a subterm that doesn't fit this pattern, you just replace it by a constant. And the next step, once we have like these abstracted versions, which have some meta variables for the type quantification and the type case instance quantification, we instantiate those meta variables. And we do this by unifying the constants and the formula. So, for example, if we once again want to reason about the less or equal relation on some pre-order and want to have the reflexivity of this relation, and we want to, let's say, prove the uh, 
proximity of less or equal on the natural numbers, then we get those two abstractions here. So we have on the one hand, the one we saw on the previous slide, and here we got the one from our goal, let's say. And we now have this constant here, has a leader E with some concrete arguments so that do not contain meta variables and some meta variables in the lemma. And then we just unify those two constants and get an instantiation for the uh, lemma from the environment. And we, we just assign that M1 is now net and M2 that has LE is net that has LE. And uh, lean will actually also synthesize type classes here. And in this step, we also need to uh, synthesize some further type class instances. For example, if the lemma was predicated on, was, had a type class instance, uh, had a type class argument for Archimedean, then we would need to synthesize the uh, well, just look through the type case instances whether this field is actually Archimedean. Okay, well, well, it's an abstraction. There are certain things we cannot express, like things we do not want to express, and also other things that unfortunately occur very often in Lean that we probably should handle in some way. So one thing that will probably be a problem fairly soon, or probably already is, uh, is that if you reason about uh, the integers modulo in some modulos, then every z over n is a different type. And so, for example, if you have z mod m plus zero and z mod n, then these would be might be translated to different types, even though you can prove that n is equal to n plus zero, which is uh, not very nice. One option to work around that is to essentially bundle these and to produce one single type in higher order logic for all uh, Zmod uh, instances, no matter the parameter, and then introduce an extra function that tells you uh, which parameter it is. In a sense, to translate Zmod to sigma n, Zmod n. And then have one whole type for sigma n, Zmod n. This should be fairly easily doable. Um, yeah, so dependent families, I mean, they occur sometimes. Like for all i, fin i, they are translated to base steps. I have no idea. I mean, if there is a, some nice translation there to handle these pi types. And, and another ugly feature that occurs in lean uh, is dependent uh, arguments. So unfortunately, lean is a dependent type theory. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, for example, I mean, I've, I, so there are probably some people here who have not seen this wonderful R option type here. So, R option is a type that is isomorphic to option. So, it, there's like, uh, so option alpha is either some A for, with A in alpha or none. And R option is exactly, is essentially the same type. And it has this wonderful accessor which allows you to uh, extract the value from a sum. Uh, give them a proof that the uh, R option is actually not none. And if you translate this to simply type parallel logic, R option does get alpha, O, and the proof will be translated to one constant, which is not very useful. Because um, there is this dependent application here, and we just translate the whole term to a single constant because we cannot uh, recurse into it. Yeah, so I mean, I think it should be possible to essentially just replace those proof arguments by, uh, so let's say, unit and ignore them. Because whenever you actually have this term in a, like in lean, there is already a proof there that uh, it's satisfied. And in higher logic, uh, you have no inhabitation issues anyhow, since all types are non empty. So I think there is, this can be handled. Okay, um, I think we're already coming to a close. So let me just quickly show you the empirical results. So I've actually implemented uh, all of that. So again, the development filter is in C++. Uh, the encodings are implemented. Uh, the first order one interfaces with Vampire. Uh, the higher order one interfaces with an extension to E uh, called EHO, which uh, adds some limited support for higher logic to the E theorem prover. This is done by Peter Mogilevich, who is also in uh, Amsterdam. And then the reconstruction is done using super. And I've tried various, all these various kinds of translations and hammered 
uh, as well as some other lean tactics on all of MATLAB plus core. So according to my calculations, there are 31,112 theorems in MATLAB plus core, uh, just counting everything that is a declaration dot THM. So this also counts some things that are not top level uh, theorems, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you see it. And then the center is that we try the tactic at exactly the same point in the file. So if you have a, like a theorem declaration in the file, uh, the center is that we essentially you can think about just replacing the proof of the theorem by, uh, by hammer or by library search or simp. And the time limit is 30 seconds. So to sum up, um, depending on the live directory of MATLAB, we get very different results. So, for example, if we consider the core library, their results are very, very promising. So, like 40% push button, everything works. And then there are directories like number theory, where yeah, um, apparently I can't get anything uh, to be proven mathematically. And in the middle, it's like currently like, let's say, 15% or so. So I think there's lots of room for improvement here. There's various bugs and performance issues that probably just require a, lot, a bit more engineering here. So let's compare this to the other tactics that we have in Lean. So interestingly enough, I was really surprised to uh, see how well library search does. <laughs> so, so for those of you who don't know, library search is a backtracking uh, general purpose backtracking tactic in Lean, which tries to apply a, a any lemma from the environment, and then uh, tries to solve the resulting goals by backtracking using uh, further lemmas, using the solve by limb tactic. Uh, so in the sense that it occupies. In algebra, a lot of the theorems are just calculation rules that are just one or two to make the same calculation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm actually surprised because they're mostly equations. And so for equations, uh, I wouldn't expect apply to work that well. But it doesn't find it here. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, okay, yeah, well, whenever I try this, I mean, of course, I, like, I, I tried in the same point in the file, so it, like, the tactic only sees what has been done before in the same file and the imported files. So it, it can prove things by itself. Okay, and uh, other interesting things is, Simp is also kind of useful. I mean, I guess we all know that. And I mean, if I could just call the reconstruction to the small, weak uh, superposition proof called super uh, on the lemmas obtained by the relevance filter, it's actually not too bad. So in the core library, it solves 20%. In logic, it solves 25%. I mean, and then it goes down. <laughs> OK. Um, so now you might think that, well, library search is much better than super, but this is just by the number of theorems. So they prove kind of different theorems. So library search probably doesn't work well on equations, while this hammer approach, I mean, it's more general. It works easily on equations and everything. So if we look at the lemmas that can be proven by the hammer, but not by the other tactics, there's, for example, in init, we can solve 30, more than 30% of uh, lemmas that can't be proven by anything else. and I mean, even in the other K directories, we can solve like five to ten percent more. Uh, yeah. So monomorphization has some effect. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm guess I'm getting to the end. Yes. Um. So. Yes. So just to conclude. Um. So library design, like, how do you structure? Li how do, you, how do you use type classes? Do you use type classes as much as in MATLAB? Have an impact on automation. I mean, you need to take into account how they work. So, I mean, in this case, I mean, like, even just ignoring type class instances uh, is something you might need to do if you want to adapt hammers from other systems to your favorite one. And so, why do we solve? So, currently, like, I mean, like, 40% maximum on the init library. I mean, I think they can be improved significantly. So I think it, like they're kind of promising results. I mean, with a bit more work, we, I think we can easily get like 10, 20 percent more out of it. Um, yeah. So the next steps, uh, I mean, essentially just do some more clever stuff about the premise selection. There is a, I've done very little work there, and then then just make it more user friendly. Actually, allow you to copy and paste the result, like the super call, back into the file, like the whole command we mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and yes, and uh, and just improve the translations and try to fix bugs. 
Yeah, so thank you. Yeah. So before the, the questions, let me just say that I got an email from, from the photographer, and uh, the executive decision is we'll do the picture indoors. <laughs> Why you can leave your coats and your stuff and just come upstairs after the uh, And I'll, I'll go up and talk to them now. So maybe five minutes of questions, and then, and then just head up to you. Or are there enough questions, or does anybody want to see a demo? <laughs> so I would suggest saving the demo for tomorrow or Friday. We will have oh. plenty of time, and I'm sure there'll be discussion around it. Oh. Okay. So, Patrick, do you have any idea when you can be able to share with that? Uh, Did you have any idea when, when the end users will be able to share with you? Uh, so I guess currently the, the, um, there are two big issues. One is that it's a bit slow and a bit buggy. So this will uh, hopefully change, I mean, very soon. The other issue is that you need a, a special version of Lean, um, mainly because the, 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 like the feature extraction is implemented in C++. And so, I mean, if you're willing to compile your own version of Lean, you, can, you could play around with it today, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, so if you really think about like in general MATLAB user, you install MATLAB, you get this. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe this summer or so. Can you print out the theorem that it the proof that it finds, and then copy it back into your regular? View? Uh, yes, so this kind of plan. So you mean like what should be easily doable is to have like a tactic snippet like super with a list of lemmas that you can paste back in. This should be doable. So there's like one extra file that just adds a few more VM functions. It's only the relevance filter. It's only the relevance filter. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, you could theoretically implement it in Lean. It's just that I've essentially translated Lean code to C++ to make it faster. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, ideally, I try to like work on the relevance filter more before it's, uh, Goes to be stable in lean, but yeah, I mean it's. I mean it's like it's one file that is pretty clean, so it, it you, you can merge it, but it's like you change it first. Yes. Uh, uh, and maybe if you want to just avoid all the non-definition of quality of being accessible to the so that it doesn't Yes, I mean, uh, so I, I agree. Uh, Z mod M equals Z mod N will probably never occur in the proof, yes. Uh, but what might occur is that you have like some sigma N, Z mod M, like a Z mod N in a structure with, where the N is bundled, and then you cannot reason about the equality in there. I guess this would be the only place where this might happen. Not sure if you actually. Yes, I mean it, it's. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not for Lean three. I mean, like, so there, there are some performance problems with Super, but I mean, at this moment, I mean, so I've actually rewritten Super a bit to potentially be able to merge it into MATLAB. But, like, there's one performance issue that I'm really not sure. I mean, it is not due to, like, lean VM. It's, uh, I mean, the one thing that takes a lot of time is just uh, matching terms. Like, uh, you have a term with meta variables and a term without meta variables, and just to check whether they're definitionally equal. Like just unifying terms, it takes a lot of time, and I have no idea, like what goes really wrong there. Yes, 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 yes. Every single time, of course, because of from tactic state, you cannot. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. That's why I mean I think in lean forward it will be much easier. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't fix it, but uh, I think we should know the difference. Yeah. Let's uh, thank you again.